Welcome to this episode of Now That's Something Good, the podcast where we explore the extraordinary in the everyday ordinary. Now here's your host, Sarah Good. Hey friends, welcome back to the Now That's Something Good podcast. I feel like I need to say Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, all the things because we took a little bit of a break. Will and I really needed, really we just need a little bit of a pause and wanted to be fully present in the midst of the holiday season, enjoy all of the things um, between just our family and work and life and all the things that we were doing. So we missed getting to share some of those things. We hope that you had a great holiday season. No, there's still a lot of sickness going around, all of that. And we hope that you are having a great start to your new year. I know we are really excited to come back and get going to share stories and just sharing a lot of good things together as we start a brand new year. If you've been listening to the podcast for a while, you know that Will and I are huge fans of vacations, which, I mean, who's not a huge fan of a vacation? But we are fans of trying to get away the two of us for about a week every beginning of a year. We like to take time to just refocus, refuel for the new year, kind of reset some priorities, just all the things, kind of recalibrate, figure out where we're at and try to start a new year pretty strong. So we got to go spend some time on some sunny beaches, which was fun, but now we're ready to get back after it. And so fun little fact is this episode, Will just told me is actually episode 40 of the podcast. I honestly cannot believe we've made it this far. When we started, we really didn't know what we were doing. We still don't really know what we're doing. We're kind of taking it episode by episode, day by day, but it brings us so much joy and so much life just to be able to share good stories with all of you, hopefully good things. We're going to take a moment and celebrate those things. God is doing so many extraordinary things all the time out of and inside of the everyday ordinary. And so we're excited to continue sharing stories with you this year. Today, we have a really fun episode with a really good friend of Will and ours. It's our friend, Brian Roach. He is a creative. He's an artist. I said he's our friend, so that's part of it. That's great. And he kind of is a Kevin Bacon lookalike, which you'll hear us talk about more in the episode. But this is a really fun story as we get to hear about his story and his life journey and some of the cool things that he's gotten to be a part of. I will tell you, it's a little bit of a longer episode. So we wanted to keep it all together. We didn't want to break it up intentionally because it kind of just all flows together. So we kept it as one. You might need to take a couple breaks and that's all right. But I hope that you will stick with it through the whole part of it because we just kind of go all over the place and all over the map in typical, now that's something good podcast fashion. But it's really great. And I really want to make sure that you listen to the end and hear about a really special project that Will and I got to be a little bit of a part of too. So make sure to stay on to the end. Without any further ado, though, let's jump right to my conversation with my really good friend, Brian Roach. Hey, friends, we are back at it, and I'm in the fun Now That's Something Good podcast studio with my friend, Brian. Brian, say hi. Hi. <laughs> How you first feeling thing about- I did was first thing I did was tap, tap my coffee mug, which you just told me He's not to do. He's already gotten reprimanded for tapping <clears throat> the coffee cup on the table. Yeah. Uh, what are you drinking in your coffee cup? Uh, an Ethiopian single source. So you need to know because here's the deal. I, I got to ask I said you a real right. big question right at the start. Yeah. Have you ever listened to an episode of Now That's Something Good? Not all the way through. No. It's all right. It's okay. But yeah. what you have missed out on is we're really serious about our coffee here. And what beverages people drink. Oh, okay. So you had to partly pick this coffee because Will gave it to you. That's true. Are you normally a coffee drinker? Yes, of course. You know that. I know, but nobody <laughs> listening knows that. I can ask okay. you questions that no, I, I, know. Not, I, know. I don't know. This is how this works. <clears throat> yeah. So if you're not here, what's your Starbucks drink? I know this too. Do you want me just to answer my own question? No, you don't <laughs> have to. What's uh, your... It's it's just a venti pike with light cream. And is Starbucks your coffee place of choice? If you could go somewhere else in the St. Louis area, where'd you go? Uh, I like Upshot. I just don't. Um, yeah, I I think I go to Starbucks just by just because it's easy. It's oh, yeah. I don't actually think it's the best coffee. I just like it, and I know it, and it's consistent. And I'm not enough of a coffee snob that you know. Yeah. Okay. So um, go back to Upshot for a second. But yeah, like when I go there, I'm like, wow, that's amazing coffee. It's do you like turmeric? Super. Do you uh, like weird drink? Like when you try different things? Yeah. Okay. Next time you go. I mean, sometimes I'll, like it, I won't try anything. You need but, to get a golden milk latte. Just okay. try it. I don't do lattes, but not because I won't. It does, they're not I just even mean, actually coffee, right? Will, he can, there's not coffee in it. It's misleading. Maybe it's not called a golden milk latte. 
Maybe a lot. A lot take by we definition doesn't mean uh, co- it doesn't mean coffee. Well, is we're gonna true? have to Google search that. Someone let us know. I okay. think it does. It has to be. It's the way the espresso is with the milk. That's why they're all different names: cappuccino, macchiato. It's all based on how much milk, foam milk, really is in with the espresso. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, I didn't know that. Oh I, look, you just learned something new. I just do. I, I just I figure the coffee is already expensive enough that if I get used to the fancy stuff. You know, my budget just goes up and just seems Fair a enough. little unnecessary. Okay. Well, that, there you and go. we drink a lot of coffee at my house. You do drink, but what's your trick? You don't drink. We drink half calf. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. We go, uh, we just, we grind it and then we shake it all together and then brew it. I like it. We used to be, uh, we used to be uh, French press exclusively. But yeah, we finished the basement and we put a pot down there so that we could make coffee for guests and, we just have yeah, you just use it. <laughs> we you don't use, it use all the, the time. French press anymore because it's too easy to just make a pot of coffee. Uh, speaking of your basement, yeah, we just need to talk about that for a second. Mm-hmm. You have a really nice basement. Would you like to tell Thanks. people what's in your basement? You said a bar. Uh, there's a bar. Sure. There's a. There's a. There's what's my a, favorite part of your basement? Do you think? Mm, maybe the shelves. Mm-hmm. Maybe yeah, well, the, shelves. the shelves. Those are my. Those are my. That was my wife's idea. The built-ins behind the couch. Yeah, but you have special things hanging in some of the shelves. Hmm. <laughs> you know what I'm talking oh, about. Oh, hanging guitars. Yes. Yeah. I was like, you really don't know what I'm talking about right now. Yeah. Yeah. So my friend, uh, my the the guy that did our basement, um, I can plug him if you want. Go for it. His can name's Chris. Plugs? His name's Chris Hamer. He's uh he's an unbelievable artist. He uh he takes his time, admittedly, but um he does beautiful work. He did uh, a basement for a friend of mine and I walked down into his basement and I was like, what on earth am I looking at? And he had built uh, a bunch of um, shelves for his, my friend's a drummer and he built a bunch of shelves. He had maybe had 12 12 snares in the wall in these like finished finished shelves with like uh, puck lights over them. And I mean, it just looked unbelievable and so we struck up a conversation with this guy and he kind of wanted to do I, I think he likes uh i think he likes working with people who are you know who have like the the music mm-hmm. interest just because yeah. I, I don't know i have no idea why actually but um but yeah he was kind of he was kind of hell-bent on um putting the guitars on the walls and i was like eh. but the way that the way that he did it looks looks pretty amazing okay i like yeah, it yeah i love it jump back and so, there's a ping pong table. And there's a ping pong table. I mean, How come you never asked me to play ping pong? Because uh, I just assumed you weren't very good at it. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be offended if that was not a completely correct <laughs> assumption. Uh, and you know me well enough just, to know that it's probably not something I would be doing. But I, you know what? I, I play the pong at a relatively high level. So uh, I don't... <laughs> oh, wow. So not only am I not, I'm not good enough <laughs> to play, not play with you, I couldn't hold my own No, position. I actually find it really therapeutic. So I will hit the ball back and forth with absolutely anybody but i do prefer um it's more therapeutic for me if i'm if i'm hitting with somebody if who the person uh, can is yeah, actually competent so that way you can just sort of hit it back like i could care less <laughs> if i compete although that's fun too but um wait what do you mean you could like you're what do you mean by compete on ping pong well I mean, have you like, been in a ping pong competition that's not what I mean. I mean, if well, we like keep score and play, first okay. of all, I have, but not like a formal one, but my, my friend and I actually <laughs> did go to, uh, I'd say maybe three or four uh, on three or four occasions. We went to the, there's what's called the USATT, uh, organizations. You, uh, I think it's United States Association of Table Tennis or something like that. And they meet, there's there's chapters and I think there are at least two or three in the St. Louis area and those people are not playing around. I mean, we went in there the first day and Brad and I, my friend, uh, we both got beat by seven year olds and 70 year olds. Like it was, <laughs> that's amazing. It, it was insane, but we got better. Seven quick. Year olds. Yeah. Cause you just sort of underestimate people and you realize it's a very, very different game when you take it seriously. Look, see, you kind of surprised me with that answer. Okay. I told Brian before the podcast, cause even, I can't imagine that's interesting. That I, well, <laughs> maybe not the most interesting thing you told me, yeah. but I said, I'm hoping he will tell me a story I've never heard before. That was yeah. close to one. Okay. So go back for a second. Tell us about your family, your day job. Well, you're not, you're just your job. What do you do for a living? 
Uh, for a living, I'm in marketing, um, creative execution. I call it brand communication design. Uh, I own a small virtual agency called 21 Republic. Um, and yeah, we do, uh, well, whatever. I don't really think we need to talk about 21 Republic, but, um, it's kind of interesting what you do. Yeah, gotten, it's fun. I mean, we have, uh, we have clients interesting. from, it is interesting. yeah, we have clients from all all different, uh, industries. Um, we usually, our entry point is usually brand identity design. Mm -hmm. And, um, so if somebody listening has no idea what that means, put it in, uh, logos. Okay. Yeah. So a lot of times it's just a company who either, either they don't like their logo or they just, they just want to change their look a little bit. Um, I've used the phrase dress for the occasion. So a lot of times, um, our, our, our ideal client, uh, has been around for a little while mm -hmm. and maybe, maybe has been growing on, you know, I'll call it borrowed graphics, okay. you know, someone that they know or, you know, whatever. And, uh, you know, either that or they're working with an agency that's just not, you know, that's just not really cutting it. Right. And so what, what we do is we build visuals that align with, you know, um, how companies want their business to be perceived. Okay. It's that simple. But, um, I mean, it's not that simple, but it's that simple. It's just sit down and sketch a couple things and you're ready to go. Yeah. Okay. Basically. Mm -hmm. Do you have a family? <laughs> do you have anybody I else do. that you would like to talk I have, about? Now I feel like I'm in, I'm in wheel of fortune. I have, uh, I have a wife. Her name is Julie. Awesome wife. Yeah. I have two girls. Um, one is from a previous. Her name is Alexa. She's mm -hmm. 25. You didn't ask me about their ages, but right. I'm telling you. Can you. you can share. And, uh, and then Julie and I have a baby girl. She's 13. Her name's Stella. I didn't say that. Yeah, Stella. Yeah, Stella is one of my favorite people. They're all amazing. I am surrounded by ladies at the house. Uh, <laughs> you are except surrounded. for Winchester, who's my little she zoo. Yeah, you can't leave out Winchester. Yeah, he's pretty he's amazing. He's a big part of the family. Yeah. He might be one and of my And he's the favorite. only dude in the house, so. Yeah, you And he really little... doesn't care about me. And he takes all of the attention that I used to get from my wife, so. <laughs> But in all fairness, he's <laughs> way cuter. So I, I, um, I don't know that I can comment on that. It's probably not entirely accurate. It's pretty close. I love it. Do you want to tell people how we know each other? How do you know the good family? Um, I can't remember where we met. Um, but I, <laughs> can't I, think, where we met. <laughs> I think it was at Two Rivers. Yeah. So you we were, go to church together. Yeah, of course. No, I was kidding. Um, yeah. So we, we both attend Two Rivers. Well, you don't really attend Two Rivers. You do. I do Wait a second. There. I don't really attend to. Rivers. You don't we, attend. You come sporadically. Sporadically, yeah. Certainly, <laughs> this last year has been sporadic. Kidding. But um, I'm always there in spirit, and we watch on, we watch online a lot. Um, and then, of course, um, I'm I'm there. We're there anytime we can be, and uh, and then I'm on the platform. You are, yeah. Every once in a while. That's really how we became. I think I'm the. I'm the person who you waited longest to tell that they, that they that made, that they made the worship team. You were also the person that made me wait the longest when I texted them and asked them to audition and then totally. No, I just freaked out. Me. I didn't, I didn't. <laughs> you, we're not going to tell that story. I did kind of ghost you. Yeah. You I did, did ghost me. That's true. It was, you were the person I think that didn't want to join the team, but wanted to join the team all in one time. It's very yeah. confusing. Yeah. Brian came on the part of the two rivers. For those of you that are true people listening, when I was the worship leader, now I have a different job. Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah, different era. Gosh. And you ignored me. Basically, I tracked him. That he walked by, <clears throat> right, walked right by me in the lobby. Basically, there's a bunch of other people you that were why. always like, Because hey. you're intimidating and unapproachable. <laughs> I didn't think there was a chance you're going to make it through this podcast episode without you, you saying that at some point. It. I know. Well, it's people need some... to know. People need, people... Well, people need their own feelings validated, right? <laughs> They're, they're walking through and they're thinking, I don't know who that lady is that runs this place, but she's intimidating <laughs> she's and unapproachable. so intimidating. And until someone actually validates their, their feelings, feelings yeah. right? They're just, they feel alone in a dark closet <laughs> <laughs> with, with their fears. Well, thank you for making them feel seen and yeah. heard. Appreciate that. But so yeah, you're not the, whoever you are, you're not the only one. So I felt it too. You, you <laughs> 
What you need to know about Brian and I. Oh my gosh, that's ridiculous. He's actually kind of scary for me to bring on this podcast because <laughs> I don't really know how to explain the relationship that you and I have. It mm. really, I basically adopted you as the older brother that, but you pick, cause you do pick on me quite frequently. Fair enough. And I'm kind of like the annoying kid sister who, you know, tags along. You'd start stuff and now you're stuck with me. I think is pretty much what I told you. Yeah. Yeah. Stuck that's, with me forever. That's pretty accurate. Uh, yeah. We, we, it goes good. I think, uh, I think will, uh, for those who don't know your husband yeah, and Julie, my wife have agreed that, that we, <laughs> that, oh, no. that we chat a lot because our significant others are tired of listening. To that it. is pretty much true. They I did think say there's that. Some truth like, to that, maybe. Brian and Sarah just talk to each other because uh, they're tired of. They can't listen to us anymore. Yeah. Hey, you know what? We got great things to say, Brian. Yeah. It's not our enough. fault. They can't keep up yeah, anymore. Truth. Anyway, okay. So I need to talk about something going way back. Okay. Like, I don't know this because I was not firsthand. We've only been friends for a few couple years, right? True. Yes. So this is going back to your, I think, high school day. I don't know how far we're going back. High school days? Yeah. Okay. You need to talk about your theater experience. Mm. What? Well, actually, that's this is what awesome. I, want you to I love that you're bringing that up. I Well, because I'm going to go somewhere with it in a minute. If you think hard enough, you know where I'm going to go. I'm going to take a poll in a minute. Okay. But... You were in theater. Okay, so back up. So at the end of the day, you're, you are very creative. Your whole world has been around this. We're going to talk about this. Very musically okay. creative, innovative, all the things. Okay. So where did the music where did the music stuff come from? We think it's my grandfather, our grandfather. Okay. So I have, I have two brothers. We're, we're all musical. Uh, my younger brother um, was on, gosh, I think it was Murr Records. He was, he was a professional musician. He still is. He's still a professional musician. Um, but he had a, he had a record deal, uh, put out uh, a couple of amazing records um, in the worship world. And, uh, and then my older brother, who I would say is arguably the, the most skilled musician of the three of us. I think Mark would probably agree. I don't know that, I don't know that J. Michael would, but, um, who's our older brother, but, uh, he's just crazy good. He's crazy good. So we're all three musical. Um, I would say that I was the late bloomer, especially on the instrument side. Okay. Um, my brother was playing guitar. My, my older brother has played guitar and piano since I can remember. Um, Mark started playing guitar and writing songs, uh, in high school. And, uh, and he was writing like good stuff, stuff I could still sing to you. Hmm. Um, <laughs> he would probably not appreciate You'd prefer it. you not do that Yeah, right maybe now, that's but... true, but, uh, or at least some of it, but, um, you want to call and ask him? I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah. Uh, and I, I think, so I, I've never had any lessons and I can't, I don't, I actually don't think they have either other than, you know, like school, right? Just kind of picked it up. Yeah. They just kind of picked it up. And so really they were my teachers. So like if I wanted to learn how to play something on the piano, I would just ask them to show me how to play it. And that's okay. how I, I kind of cut my teeth, if you will. So when did you start picking up an instrument and what was, was it piano or guitar? I bought a or guitar drums? in college. That was the first instrument you owned? Yes. And I didn't really know how to play it. And I just remember, uh, I took it to school with me and, and I just remember trying to figure out, you know, well, first of all, trying to fret it enough that my fingers didn't hurt. And then, and then I think the big thing for any new guitar player is, is bar chords. It's getting mm. through bar chords, but I never really wanted, I never really cared about getting good at guitar. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to be able to accompany myself. Cause you as sang. A, you as, already yeah, as a singer and a, and maybe, you know, and, and like start writing songs and stuff like that. Although I think, um, I didn't start writing until at least a year or two after college. Um, cause you all, did and, you, did your brother plays your brothers play sports too? Do you all play sports? Yeah. So we all grew up playing hockey. My dad sat us down when I was four, maybe five. And you're I remember this distinctly. He sat us down at our round kitchen table <laughs> in grief And he asked all three of us, what do you guys think about playing hockey? And we were all like, yep. And, uh, so my Mark must have been, I, I mean, he must have been three. Wow. Yeah. M maybe he was pushing four okay. and I was, and I was pushing six because we're basically all two years apart. But, um, 
Yeah. So they were, and, and, uh, J Michael, uh, what, so he played, I think he played defense when he was a kid. So we all played about, f- about four or five years. And then, uh, we stopped playing when, uh, my parents were divorced when I was in fourth grade. So I think I was like around 10, something like that. We uh, moved why away. Did I think there was you a whole bunch of longer than that. I have no idea. Okay. No. Well, and then I went back to it. Um, Maybe that's what. but when I was a kid, you couldn't like hockey wasn't everywhere like it is now the schools didn't have teams okay so you know we moved away we came back by the time i went i started going to high school uh we were out here in wentzville i think the francis howell district had a team but no one else out here did now now everyone does where did you go to high school wentzville we've already joked that's what it was called back then it was yeah it was called it, it well it was it was still, it was called Emil E. Holt, but nobody okay. called it that because it was the only, it was just Wentzville High School. Okay. WHS is what it was called because it was the only one. None of Wentzville was there when I was, I, it's, it's been a really long time. It's crazy. That's, that's crazy. Okay. So somewhere in there though, you picked up mm-hmm. doing, did you do theater or musical? What was, all, did you act to, or was it just all the singing musicals? Um, I mean, obviously there's acting, acting. and musicals, but yeah, like, did you I, ever do just I did straight acting in college. theater yeah. things? So, uh, my first experience, like in a play, is that, was it fair to yeah. start with that? Okay. Yeah, my yeah. first experience in a play was in sixth grade. Uh, I did, I was in choir. Um, <laughs> I had a defining moment in sixth grade choir because, uh, I got in trouble and Denise Reisner, bless her heart, who I actually <laughs> thanked on my, uh, first record because, uh, I don't think I would have done any of this uh, without her encouragement. Um, but I got in trouble in choir. You're going <laughs> to, I can't believe I'm going to tell this story, but. Uh, uh, this is a story I haven't heard. I'm yeah, excited. Go ahead yeah. and tell it. Go I ahead. got in trouble. That's not surprising to me. Mm. Fair, <laughs> fair. Uh, I got in trouble. So after choir class, she was like, I need to talk to you. And so I, I walked up. She usually sat at the piano when she taught class. And so I walked up to the piano and I, you know, it was an upright. So I'm standing on the, I'm standing on the back side of the piano and she's sitting at the piano and she's basically scolding me for, you know, whatever. You don't and, remember what you did? Hmm? What were you doing? Oh, I think I was talking or, oh. you know, I mean, like I was a little bit of a class clown shocker. Uh, anyway, um, I really had to go to the bathroom and that's exactly what I did. You, <laughs> I swear I peed my pants right there, <laughs> <laughs> right there getting yelled at. And she, could, so she's yelling at me. <laughs> I'm telling you, this is the truth. So she's, she's not yelling at what? me, but she's sitting here scolding me. And then she just looks at me and she's like, what is wrong? And I'm like, yeah, I peed my pants. <laughs> I don't, I think that's exactly how I said it. Cause I didn't know how to, how else to say it. I'm probably getting wrecked Wait, cause it's a little silly. Sixth grade. But, I'm going to need a sixth grade picture of Brian. Cause I'm going to need to get the full picture in my head. How old are you in sixth grade? Like 11? Mm, yes. Something oh like my that. Goodness. 11, 11, and you 12. Pe- you- that was the first year that I was, that I was told that was the year Footloose came out. So that was the first year that I started being told that I look like Kevin Bacon. Mm, I'm going to come even, back to that. I'm so that, glad you know, that you but, said uh, that. Anyway. So, uh, <clears throat> that story was unrelated they to the musical, you, wait, of wait, course. Wait, hold up a second. Hmm. In sixth grade, they told you you look like Kevin Bacon. Hundred percent. So you need to know. We're gonna have to post a picture of Brian. How many times in your like? How often? So it's, it started in sixth grade. You get asked often. How do they ask you? How do people say it? They just say you look like Kevin Bacon. What do they say? I mean, I've been around sometimes when people say it to you, but yeah, it's usually just has anyone ever told you, and then I. T- I tend to just finish their sentence. It all depends on, you know, what kind of mood I'm in, how they approach me. Sometimes I can actually tell from across the room the way someone's looking at me that that I know what they're gonna say when they when they approach me. And when he is the more grade, like the more popular whatever his current project is, yeah. the more I get it when I'm out in public. So like crazy. I remember, I think he was off the radar for quite a while. And that show, the following came out Yeah, and I didn't even, I didn't watch it. I've never seen it. Um, and I, I really, the, the way I realized that it was out was all of a sudden people were saying that to me on a daily basis yeah. instead of occasionally. And then someone was like, have you seen the following? And I'm like, no, I haven't seen his it. look in that movie could be the, or in that TV show is probably the closest I would say, if I would ever say you look similar would be. I could see why people would say that when that came out because he had a shorter hair. I mean, I still have friends who who will send me something on Instagram and be like, 
dude, this is you or, and, and sometimes I open it up and I'm like, oh man, so do- <laughs> that looks so much like me. It just depends. It just depends. Yeah. So funny. So do you want to tell people right now your social media profile picture, what it is? They can't even find, no one can even see what you really look oh, like. Oh, it you is actually much- Kevin Bacon. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Well, that's uh, a buddy of mine told me, uh, I don't know. I, I think he was just giving me trouble, but he's like, you just need to own that. And then I think, I don't know, maybe a couple of months later, I think I just saw a photo and I, I just, it just occurred to me that it might be funny and it really cracked me up. I just changed my profile, uh, pick to it. And, uh, he texted me touche. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> and so I've gone back and forth. The craziest thing is that when I update my photo with a picture of Kevin Bacon, I will still get people who know me well, so who crazy. will comment like, it's me. They'll, they'll say something about the photo. And I'm like, really, man? Like, I'm just going to do that now for forever. Like it's, when you, you post know, one, like, like, Oh, that's a great picture, Brian. It's not, it's, it's not Brian. that close. Like I get, I get the association, but it's, you know, we don't look that we'll much. Let the, of, now that something good audience be the judge. I'm not to put, do a side by side in our stories. We'll let them see Brian. Actually, that'd be great. We can post a couple. Is this Brian, Kevin Bacon, Brian, Kevin Bacon, and they can decide. Stick it oh, back no. together. Everyone, everyone would figure it out. I don't know. They don't uh, know what you look like. He and his brother came into town. Um, I don't know, probably four or five years back. They they were at Old Rock House. Oh, and I was so close to going down there and just bum rushing him and being like, "Bro, like I've I've been hearing this my, my whole life." Uh, since but I chickened out. Grade. Yeah, I chickened that out. That is literally ridiculous. That for that amount of time, people <clears throat> would think you look like him. It, or similar enough. Like yeah. That's real, people change a lot. Like, especially guys, I feel like. Espe- like, when you went to college, yeah, right? like, usually when, from going from adolescence to an adult, like. Yeah, because that's, that's, that's a long time. Yeah. How old was he when Footloose came out? Mm. Maybe he was younger than. We'll have to Google search. I don't know. I, I think that. he we'll is. Put it in the if show. he's not 60 yet, he's really close. I think he's in his 60s. Yeah. I think we've looked so this he's, up before. He's quite a bit, he's quite, he's quite a bit older than me, but. um. Uh, the funny uh, yeah, thing is t- his again, wife I has blonde likeness. hair like Julie. There was a picture, we yeah. were out somewhere and someone showed a picture and I was like, she almost, I mean, like if you just did it yeah, quick, yeah. she's got, she had short blonde hair like she has right now and it looked kind of blondish, brownish, whatever color. Maybe. Anyway. Okay, anyway, so sixth grade, Brian, penis yeah, this pants. Is, you literally How asked the heck me about, did you, <laughs> you, you didn't said have to Kevin that. Bacon. <laughs> you actually <laughs> we, asked you know me about we're going theater. back there. So yeah, we're so, get there. so, so back to Denise Reisner, she, uh, we had a musical that year. It was called teen or, or it was teen two. I can't remember which, which one, I think it was the first one, but, um, she actually approached me after auditions and asked me, why didn't you audition for the musical? And I don't remember my answer, but she encouraged me to sing, uh, to to do like a like a post auditions audition in choir and she just gave she gave me a solo in the in our next choir class and then cast me as the understudy to the lead okay so i don't know there were maybe three performances and and i guess the way that it worked was i instead of just being the understudy i actually did i played the part one time and then the guy who had the lead played it all the other times. Um, so that was, that was my first taste of it. And I thought it was awesome. And I had tons of fun. And, um, and I, th- I'm pretty sure that the following year I was, I auditioned and was in it. It's kind of funny that I can't remember if that's true. Um, I mean, that was like a really long time ago. It was, <laughs> unfortunately it was a really long time ago, but I don't um, remember anything from sixth grade, but yeah. So for sure, theater like theater theater my my favorite thing my favorite uh performance style ever is choir i think probably Mm -hmm. always always will be i just have um i had an amazing choir director in uh well obviously denise and then jan null at wentzville who i i think is retired um also just an unbelievable influence in my life, but just that experience that four years, it was something that I looked, I looked forward to. And I just, I loved, you know, we toured it. We, um, in college, uh, uh we did a choir tour in, um, uh, Europe. So I, you know, I've sang in, I don't think just, I realized you were in choir that much. Yeah. I sang in just, just, 
unbelievable cathedrals. I've just, I've sung, it's just a really cool experience because it's yeah. just, it's just nothing but voices. voices and, yeah. and you learn how to blend, you learn how to listen, um, you know, you learn how to, you know, just serve a bigger thing. And, you know, I don't know, there's just something really, really cool about it. No, I agree. Uh, we but went- then theater was definitely my, my second love, right? Did they just make kinda you came sight- alongside did you, it. Did you ever do oh, yeah. any of the competitions? Like where you'd go oh, and yeah. you sing all together? Yeah, and our, choirs went to, I, our, our choirs yeah. went to state every year and we got good scores. I don't really know. I mean, honestly, I have no idea like where we were on the grand scheme of things, yeah. but, um, but, uh, but it was a good, it was a good choir. I think credit to Jan Null. I think he just, he was the type of person that, um, people gravitated toward. So anyone who could sing kind of wanted to be a part of it, yeah, right? That's cool. Choir's not always a cool thing to do, but no. in when, when I was in high school, like there was a, first of all, the choir was big <clears throat> and there were, you know, popular people, athletes, mm-hmm. goofballs like me, everybody was ever like, there were a lot of people in, in choir and, and it was, and it was good. And that's where we sang. Um, I think my, junior or senior year we did handles messiah with uh with a community choir it's unbelievable unbelievable okay cool. we'll have the swap choir story sometime not on the podcast we won't totally nerd out on that to make yeah. everybody else who has no idea what we're talking about <laughs> yeah but yep. the sight reading part that was always the my favorite was when they made you do it as a whole choir and there'd always be some buffoon that couldn't do it and like literally like Oh yeah, How I hard forgot is about this? that. Like, fought, like, yeah, at competition, uh, they would just give you a random yeah. piece of music, and you just, everyone just had. It would to, also simultaneously that thing every time made me so nervous. I know yeah, how to do it. I, could I totally still, forgot about that. Yeah, those were all. I don't, and I don't think we were ever any like so that good. The if college you don't know choir would have been better at it. Reading but. it, it's basically like reading music. Cult. Like they would give you a piece of music, and you had to sing it without you've never seen it never heard it and you had to follow along to it and so yeah you get a I pitch mean, yeah that's you get it. a general pitch it's, that everyone works off of and then you just it's one two terrifying. three go i was gonna yeah. do it as choir but then that was always part of our finals we'd go up all by yourself from everybody else inside like, yeah not my favorite thing i can but do in, it but in college but, i mean you've you've got you know you've got a group of people that can basically just Oh. Just do that. I mean, it's yeah. crazy. Like the f- if you can't sight read by the time you've made it to college, and especially if you're a music major, you're you're probably not gonna yeah. last. But or you're at a small school. <laughs> yeah, and or desperate, and you at least have some other talent to back up on. Hmm. Okay, so we got this. Is my poll time? I need. Well, actually, oh, poll time. Poll okay. time. I need. Well, back up. Were you a lead in a musical ever? I. Thank you for asking. You're that. welcome. I have only ever been I, <laughs> a lead. <laughs> I just inadvertently set him up perfectly so for that. Ridiculous. Thank you for asking so I can humbly tell you that uh, I've only ever been the lead. Uh, what was your favorite lead role, Brian, in your small high school in well, Wentzville that you were? First of all, I haven't been. Well, first of all, that includes college. Thank college. you very much. Where did you go to college? Uh, Culver, I went to Culver oh, Stockton for two okay. years and then... Uh, uh, and, and then I went to K State for half a semester, or for a half a year, one semester. Did you go to do theater or music? What did you go for? Uh, I was music and theater. I was a double major uh, at Culver, and you know we then talked about, I don't remember. And then I think I think I think I switched to maybe just. Actually, I think I dropped the music major shortly after I realized I didn't want to learn theory. Yeah, you and I. Uh, that's we. Yeah. yeah, and so I was just a theater major, and by the time I got to K State. Uh, I realized that a theater degree was going to be basically worthless yeah. for for anything that Sadly. I really wanted to do. Yeah. So, so I just I just dropped out of college. That's the really unfortunate <clears throat> things about any of the majors in the arts is that unless you really are like, I want to go be a teacher, but you still need an education degree or whatever, or you're going to be on Broadway, or you're going to really be an actor or whatever, or you're going to make and have a music deal, which you did, but <laughs> like, yeah, what are you going to do with it? It's, it's sad. Cause I think the arts really in general, tough. right. It's like, it's like going to film school and thinking that you're going to, you know, make yeah. movies for a living. It's like, that's uh, unfortunately in, in all of those worlds, you got to you got to grind it out. Yeah. Um, that's a good... it, marketing is even similar, right? Like you can't just go to, you can't just go to college and leave with a design degree and expect that, you know, if you don't have, yeah, I mean, I think it's a little bit different, but, um, yeah, you still kind of got to get in it and grind it out. And to be quite honest with you, if you've got talent, um, you don't, you also don't need the degree. You yeah. just, you just, you just get in there and get after it. And yeah, fair enough. 
Okay, so what's your favorite musical? <clears throat> Lame is. Really? Probably. Okay. Um, I mean, probably. I. It, I was. Um, you don't have to second guess the answer. That's fine. That's it. That's it. Yeah. There's no right or wrong musical answer. I feel like. Unless I think you it been is. Like, cats. Sorry if that's your favorite musical listening. Yeah, that's that offensive. Would have been like. <laughs> Or like some random. <clears throat> I would say I probably know like seventy-five to eighty percent of the libretto of Les Mis. Really? Like I could start singing it for you probably right now. Right no, now, we want to hear. I'm not doing. It. No, okay. Um, I've tried people. Look tried. down. Look down. Those are the first two words. Uh, I <clears throat> actually, it's it's more like uh. I think that's the first two words. So the, <laughs> but, it, yeah, you're right. Yeah. The the second any of that stuff starts, I instantly cry. I cannot. I like. I Ugh. know what's going to happen. That it like mm. in the music really is very. I it gets. I can't even. I yeah, can't even I was it. obsessed <laughs> the first with the part of the musical. I was obsessed with the music in high school. I listened to. So have you heard the complete symphonic recording? I'm sure you have. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So uh, I had that on CD, and that actually came with. The, the book that came with that had the complete libretto written out. Oh. So the lyrics from, from word one to, um, to the end were, were there. And I just used to, I used to sit, well, I got grounded a lot in high school too. So that has a lot to do with it. I would just sit in my room and listen to songs and sing along do, with them. Do we want to know what you did to get grounded in high school? You know what? Let's not even go there because okay, it, we don't have of, enough time. None of it was actually, it was never actually that big of a deal. We just kind of had a, we, um, let's just call it a strict household. I understand that. I, yeah. told, I tell you, well, I'm not going to tell you my story. I'll yeah. tell you that story in the time. But <clears throat> yeah, I understand strict. Okay. Well, yeah. you had a lot of musical time because you were in your room. On yeah. Yeah. So That's I listened fine. to that. I listened to that a ton. And I think I just, you know, I just fell in love with it. And um, there was a dude that uh, played the merriest part who I thought had the coolest voice mm. on the planet. <clears throat> and, uh, but I didn't, I never, uh, I never really cried listening to that because I was just obsessed with the music and, yeah, and yeah. the melodies and all that stuff. I never really, I don't think I ever really absorbed the story until I saw the movie that they made with Hugh Jackman uh -huh. and, oh, yeah. um, and I, Anne Hathaway, bald. Yeah. Bald. No, I, bald. I was a mess. And we, we went back maybe three or four days later and I, uh, we went with someone else and I bawled, I think worse. And I was like, this is the worst story that I've ever, like, you're just, it's it just, is kinda... so, it's so, yeah, there's just something that's a little bit more, the, the, the reality of the story is so much more accessible in the movie than it is, yeah. you know, that in the theater, it's just, it's theatrics, right. right? Right. It's really about singing, you know, like if you, if you listen to the movie soundtrack in your car, you're like, this is, this is a way to ruin my day. It's miserable. <laughs> right. But, right. You know, rightfully so, but it is, it's really not as much about singing well as it is about storytelling. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's why it hits so much harder. I, I don't know, but. Sto yeah. I mean, when you can tell a good story, right. That's the, that's the piece. Yeah. You want to know a little known Sarah fact? I do. So. <laughs> is this going to be something I don't know? No, but you could probably guess this. It's not that profound. I felt like you just built it up to be this bigger thing because now you're going to be let down when I tell you. So we have a joke. I talk about I'm not a big crier. I cry at really good things, but not like I'm not just super overly emotional. Really good music anytime. I can't like I cannot get. We were watching a movie last night that's a musical. I'm not going to say which one it is right now, but watching it, I, can, I couldn't even get. It's so good. Great that literally, it's not the greatest showman. No. Although that 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 listens to that music it does something in you and it, like it how i emote is it makes me cry every yeah. time I listen to it the greatest showman that is i'm a bit of a sap julie and i tease each other about how sappy we are i mean we like nothing wrong i will that. like random i remember this is before we moved out here but i remember i was randomly at like i was i swear i was like vacuuming <laughs> i'm not even kidding i was like vacuuming <laughs> and i don't think 
my wife was around, but the TV was on and <laughs> dirty dancing was on. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like literally just like cleaning the condo or something. And the scene with the dance where they do the lift oh, and I'm like yeah. standing totally- there getting teared up, <laughs> watching the lift thinking, man, I have got to get, I got to get it together. This is why we, no we will reason. never watch a musical. We won't be able to watch uh, musicals together. I totally, yeah. uh, we were watching I, story White Christmas. Gets me, I'm a wreck. Yeah. We got to watch White I Christmas. I don't cry at White Christmas. It you told me that me that first song gets you every time. Every time in the army and Bing Crosby, I cannot yeah. get through the whole thing. And then at the end, then there's a the little ballerina kids and they're coming out. Yeah. yeah. We, we definitely watch that movie several times every Christmas season, but it doesn't make me cry. So all of you listening, I'm going to need you to write in and tell us one, if you like musical, you might, we might've just lost half of you. I'm sorry if we did, but we like musicals. So nothing wrong with that. It's yeah. It's good. pretty nerdy. It's okay. We can live with it. Tell us what your favorite musical is. But Brian and I have a little debate going. Mm-hmm. Well, he, it's oh, really I debate. love it. So Bring it on. He has not watched Hamilton. Truth. Which for the last, I don't know how long it's been out. 15 years, 10, 10 years easily, whatever. It's, it's only been two it's or been three. It's been one I of think. the most critical, two or three years. That's been the <laughs> pandemic. It's been longer <laughs> than that. Two or three years. It's been out longer than that. You haven't even listened to it. You won't even, one First note. Of all. In my defense, uh, go try to have I, a defense for this. I did. I did start it. Uh, yeah, you were like, I fell I asleep, or I didn't like it, or something. Crazy. Well, Stella wasn't interested, so That's we what, we okay. started it as a family, and Stella was like, "Ugh," and I'm like, "Okay." Um, uh, but yeah, I, I don't know. Um, I get it. I get people love it. Um, I think that I've heard enough of it to know that it's maybe just not up my alley. That's fair enough. I could fair be wrong. Enough. Like maybe. Maybe it would be worth watching, but uh, but I do think that what's his Manuel dude is extraordinary uh, and and uh, one of a kind talent. You um, do like so in your I will defend you. Mm, you do like him. You just yeah. don't like him in Hamilton necessarily. It's just because your fa- one of your other favorite musicals that I say is not a good one necessarily. He's in. I would not call that a favorite. I just think it's really good. You told me you cry when you, I think that's the one you said you oh, cry yeah, now too. Some, yeah. Well, I mean, there's maybe, yeah, that's, I Mary mean, Poppins returns. First of all, I just admitted that I'm a sap and I cry all the time, but yeah, there, so <laughs> it's the second. Yeah. Mary Poppins returns. Uh, I think he's fantastic in it, but there's this scene toward the beginning where the, um, I guess it's the kid from the first movie, but now he's the husband and he's lost his wife and he's in the attic yeah. looking for something and he's just singing about her not being there. And it's just extraordinarily authentic and it just hit me the first time I heard it and I still love that song. I I got nothing to say. That's fine. Yeah. You can, well, you there's can have, nothing to say about that. that. There is nothing. It's just not my personal favorite. So uh, he won't go see Hamilton and I said, I'm not watching Mary Poppins Returns anymore. That's crazy. It's, I will watch it. I actually like it. It's, it's way better than nobody Hamilton. Is, when you call something <laughs> Mary Poppins. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to the Fox and May to see it. You should, you and Julie, you should come see it. Mm. It's going to be good. It's coming. Actually, it might all be sold out. I honestly don't. I don't think that I would be interested. Like, if I'd have, if I'd have gotten to see it, if I if I'd have had the opportunity to see it with him yeah. in it, I think that's one thing. But I don't know. I I don't. To me, like this is going to be um, completely. This is going to be a, an absurd comment. But to me, they call those a like, hot take. To me, <laughs> your hot take on something that's not okay. Go ahead. Yeah, t- to me, going to see that play without him in it is kind of like going to see uh, that Alanis Morissette monstrosity thing where they sing all of her songs. <laughs> on it's Broadway, like seeing White Christmas with being so cr- without being it's Crosby. It's so cringy. I can't watch. I can't watch ten seconds of those people singing Alanis Morissette song. What's that called? It's called Jagged Little you're... Pill or something like oh, that. Like after her. her. I'm sorry yeah, for anyone who loves the musical, but I it is just the worst for me. It's the worst. I, so it's probably nowhere near it. as bad as seeing or seeing Hannibal without Manuel is probably nowhere near as bad as that. But um, probably not. That's but, a strong opinion, and I shouldn't say mean things like that. Right, but, it's okay. You can have a strong opinion. But here. it's we'll garbage. Allow. That's not something good, though. No, <laughs> you only do good things here, Brian. Only I mean, it's really things. good, man. Those guys are so very <laughs> no, good. No, no. Okay, so we need to talk about somehow you got from. <laughs> I'm going to say sixth grade peeing your pants 10 times. You should have never. Why are it. you repeating that? Oh my gosh. <laughs> my favorite thing you said so far on this podcast. Okay. From there, theater, college, somewhere along the line, you're like, huh, 
what did you think you were going to do? Well, okay, we got to get to this music career part. Yeah, I had a totally unrealistic what part did, of that. What was so the, I had, I've been in uh I was only in a few mu- in, in a few musicals. So in uh I, I'm I'm going to tell you them because okay, you go asked. Ahead. I, did I ask. was in I know um, one of them, I think. I was in Once Upon a Mattress. Okay. Are you familiar with that? Yes. Yeah, unbelievable. Hilarious show. As the lead. Uh well, yes, I was the <laughs> minstrel. So is, there is there the, it's 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 kind of an ensemble cast, but uh-huh. there is um technically the lead leads uh-huh. are so, uh the princess uh I remember her name Winifred because it's Winifred. Yeah. Uh, but I don't remember anybody else. But um technically they're the leads, but okay. the minstrel's okay. got pretty good because he's the basically the story that he's the narrator, I think, of that uh musical okay. if i remember correctly and then oklahoma mm-hmm. uh played curly that's arguably a lead <laughs> uh and then in college um i was in camelot <laughs> played lancelot arguably a lead <laughs> and then uh, are there video clips of this and then yes for oh, sure man i'm gonna and need then, to see that uh, and then an, another very, very <laughs> not well-known musical called The Robber Bridegroom, which Never heard of might it. have been the best experience that I've had in theater, only because the cast was... That was in college? Yeah, the cast was awesome. Um, the, the story is absolutely ridiculous, but the, some of the music was really good. It, yeah, it was just, yeah. Anyway. Okay, so in college, That's you're it. doing... Ooh, and I was in Godspell. Forgot oh. about that. Total ensemble there. That's fun. That's a fun. Arguably one. not a lead because there's really only one lead in that. So you really weren't it's the Jesus. It's Jesus. <laughs> the Jesus. Jesus. The lead story. Yes. Okay. So David White. How the heck did you go from there to being signed with Columbia? That's a big jump. I know. I gotta get somewhere. We gotta get to this record deal. Brian, if okay. you don't know, Brian has had a record. You have a <clears throat> whole music career. I had a record deal. Had a record deal. <laughs> he. Uh. <laughs> Which. Yeah, I want to talk about. All right, so I got out of I got out of college, um, and I had my acoustic and I had a keyboard and I was writing some songs. Uh, oh, it's funny. So, uh, so the maintenance person at my apartment, okay, after college, was in a band, and he was over at my apartment doing some repairs, and he saw my gear uh, just sitting out. I had just like my keyboard, and I don't know what else. Um, and so we struck up a conversation and he was like, well, my band's kind of looking for a lead singer. They were significant. I should say significantly. They're, they're maybe 10 years older than me. Um, but they were playing gigs around town and, um, I, I think I just went out to a rehearsal and sang and that was the end of it. I started, I started fronting for that band. They were called naked fish. <laughs> I swear. <laughs> and uh you have the most interesting band names of anything. I've well, I didn't name that, but well, uh, but they were actually they were actually a really good band and that was the um that was the first real band that I was uh ever in and I played acoustic even though I was still not a very good acoustic guitar player or guitar player in general. Um I played acoustic in that band for like maybe three or four songs. Okay. You know, like Every Rose Has Its Thorn or something like that. Uh, and a couple more. Um, but yeah, so we, we did that. Um, and then I got, I got poached by another local cover band that was playing, uh, way cooler rooms, rooms like, uh, boomers on the landing and fat Tuesday and other, other places that were around way back in the day. And, um, and I, just, I couldn't help it. And I, I, I left that, I left naked fish, um, like literally just called and said, I'm not going to be there this weekend. Cause I'm in a new band now, which is probably not cool, but I did it. Um, <laughs> that band was called painted faces. It doesn't really matter. Anyway, uh, still know, <laughs> still know a bunch of those guys from those days. Um, so, but I was part of the cover band circuit for, for a long time. And what was funny is I, uh, I think I thought in my head that I was on my way to being a famous front man. Right. Yeah. But I wasn't really doing anything. I wasn't, I was, I was on no path toward that. Um, and that's what you wanted to, like at that it's point, what I, that yeah, was the it's what goal. I wanted to do, but I just, um, I just, I just, di- I didn't realize that I was, I, you know, I, I just, 
I was just young and I just thought like somebody's going to walk in and be like, dude, that singer is awesome. And let's like all of the thing. <laughs> it's just like understanding zero of the things yeah. about how that process actually happens. Right. So that's what I had in my head. But, um, at, at some point, um, I mean, I, I don't remember what year it was, but it probably would have been, um, uh, it was, it was just a couple of years after I stopped doing the cover band thing. But, um, this guy, Brian Regula, I'll never forget this. Uh, he, boomers changed ownership and there was this lucky strike battle of the bands that was going to happen at the, at the club. And he said, Hey man, I think you guys are really good and you should, this was the new, Brian was the new manager. Okay. Um, and he was like, you guys should, you guys should, uh, enter this competition or whatever it was. And I was like, eh, I said, well, first of all, I don't, you know, um, music as a competition kind of seems strange to me, but then also like this is for original bands. We're a cover band. And he was like, what does that mean? I was like, original bands like play their own music. They write their own songs. They play their own songs. Um, and he was like, Oh, okay. He said, do you, do you have any of your own songs? I said, no. And he goes, well, can you, can you write some? <laughs> I swear this is how the conversation went. And I was like, um, yeah, I guess we could. And so I signed our band up for this competition and we had no songs. Love it. Um, and so I, I wrote, f I think I wrote five songs, maybe six in, I think we had 30 days or something like that. <laughs> um, uh, between the time that I agreed to do the competition and talk about just giving yourself a deadline, right? Yeah. Uh, so we signed up for the competition and, and I was like, we're going to write some songs. And so we wrote five or six songs and played them at that competition i think we got like second place which really who cares um <laughs> but that's that's how i got the that's how i got the songwriting bug that's how i you know and i i mean mark was already doing it a ton so I, it's not like i didn't think that i could do it but that's how i that's how i figured out that um uh that's when i learned that i that i you know that i could at least craft a tune from beginning to end yeah um and I think I've told you this, but one of the songs that we played uh, at that competition, it was called All That I Wanted, okay. made, made our Columbia Records debut. So we recorded that in Vancouver years later when, um, so I thought that was pretty cool. Because it's like, cool. you know, yeah. that was probably, that might have been the second or third song I ever wrote, really. Nuts. Um, and uh, yeah, there was a producer in Memphis that liked it, and then uh, it made the cut when we recorded the when we recorded the the first uh, Auto Vane album. So that's fun. So how did you get from getting second place at this contest competition to a record deal? Uh, so that band was called Fly Nova. Uh, we had some personnel changes um, and some guys that just knew a lot more about what I, I mean, I'm going to say this. It's going to, I, I don't want to discredit the people that I have always been surrounded by really good musicians. So no discredit to anyone else, but fly Nova. Um, we, some guys joined the band that, you know, had just kind of been around the block. One had been yeah. to Europe and back toured with a, a pretty good sized band and just kind of knew a little bit more about what it would take to kind of take things up to the next level. Yeah. And then, um, while we were working as a band, I was doing like acoustic, sh uh, like acoustic shows in the evenings at bars, one of them, which was boomers and yeah. my friend Ryan, who used to sing for a band called green wheel, uh, was there. We struck it up. We hung out, had a conversation and he said, you guys should open us or open for us sometime at, I think they had just signed to Island records. Okay. Um, or, you know, within the last like six or eight months, they were working on their first album, um, or they were getting ready to tour. I don't know. But they, when they played Mississippi nights, they, you know, they would have, and when they played anywhere in St. Louis, they would have a good crowd. And I think at that time, pretty much Mississippi nights was the only place that they would play because it was yeah. big enough. So, um, anyway, so we stayed in touch and we booked a date, uh, in, um, I, I don't remember. And, uh, when we opened for them, um, their A&R guy from Island Records was there. And, um, 
Green Wheels manager. Tell, tell everybody what an A&R guy is. Oh, an A&R guy. So it's, I think it's artists and repertoire is what it sounds like, is what it stands for. Basically an, a, an A&R guy goes, goes, works for a label, goes out and looks for talent. Uh, and they're in charge, they're, they're, they're in charge of finding and developing okay. talent. Yeah. Um, that's the simple version of it. Um, anyway, so he was there, Green Wheels A&R person from, Island Records was there, and I remember Green Wheels' manager walking up to me and saying, after our set, and saying, good things are happening for your band right now. And I was like, okay, I don't even know what that means. <laughs> and, I mean, I kind of knew what that meant, and my guitar player at the time, who was pretty savvy in the industry because he had been in that other band, um, you know, he did he did a little bit of the navigating, um, which I think boded well for us, and like two months later, maybe a month later, we were in New York showcasing for Island records and a couple of, a couple of other, a couple of other labels. So that's kind of how, that's kind of how it started. I think that's when I realized that we were doing things well enough to at least get the attention of, you know, uh, of people in the industry. Uh, that band, uh, we probably did I don't know, over the course of the next year, we probably did six or seven showcases for almost every label. Yeah. Um, uh, met some friends. That's how we, that's how, uh, that's how we picked up, um, our first attorney. Um, that's how I got associated with, uh, BMI, um, which is a performance rights or whatever. Anyway. Um, but I think that's when I realized, okay, I, I, if I take this seriously, yeah. it might be something that I, that I can do. And so at that point, um, shortly after that, I, th- I think after that, what, when we weren't, we weren't able to get a deal. And so the band basically broke up, which is a pretty stre- stressful time, but I just decided like, um, I'm not, I'm not finished. Mm-hmm. And so I started, um, this is just not a short story, but I'm trying to make it quick. That's but, all right, yeah. So I started, uh, I started writing on my own. Um, my guitar player had introduced me to Pro Tools, and so I had, uh, I had a, a little recording set up in the basement, and I would just start like typing in drums and writing songs. Um, and over the course of, I think, maybe the next year, um, I put out uh, an EP under a new name and yeah, got the, got the attention of, uh, one of my good friends now, his name's Darren Hall. He used to work for, I think clear channel. Now he works for, uh, enterprise, but, um, he, uh, and and I think he was associated with the point for a long time too. And so he, he sent me, he sent me an email and he was like, Hey, give me a call. And this is someone who I couldn't get to so much as sneeze at me uh, prior to it. So I, I called him. I, I will never forget this phone call because, you know, when you're when you're working really hard to get, you know, when you're a, you, a musician and you're working, <clears throat> like, first of all, we're all sort of in love with the stuff that we do. Like, yeah. you know, it's it, it it's it's a process to get to the point where um, you're actually critical of what mm-hmm. you create. Um, and I I think I was closer to that by that time. But you still you still sort of know what it feels like when you're 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 gunning for attention. You're trying to get somebody to notice what you're doing or like what you're doing or whatever. And it can feel just like, you know, trying to run through sludge. Mm. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, um, yeah. So I got this email and he said, it just said like, dude, call me or something like that. (laughs) And it was Darren Hall. So I'm like, I'm going to call this guy right away. So I picked up the phone and I called him and he answered the phone, dude, I love your new band. That's wow. what he said. And I was like, uh, okay. <clears throat> and he was from that point on instrumental in, in putting, you know, I- instrumental in our success. He put, uh, I say success, but you know what I mean? He put us, uh, in front of some of the biggest acts on the planet when they were coming through town. Yeah. Um, he gave us just absolutely every opportunity. He, he, uh, opened doors, uh, at the point, introduced me to everyone over there, which is an unbelievable group of people. Most of them are s- still there, honestly. <clears throat> but, um, yeah. Um, so, so, and somewhere at that point, I, I picked up a manager, uh, and, um, and a new attorney 
and he helped me uh, solidify the lineup of of the band and start showcasing for a second go round. Mm-hmm. And we went to Chicago and we played this. Uh, we played this. Uh, let's call it a festival. It was called Mob Fest, and uh, we played at the at the Double Door in Chicago. And David Andrioni, who is still a friend, um, he was there from Columbia Records. And I think I went home <clears throat> after that show. There's, I'm skipping like thousands of details. It's, all right. it's, ha- it's a long story. I mean, this was but- over how much time, <clears throat> I mean, from the time you started the band, I mean, how much time, and you're in your, you're in your 20, 30, 20s, 30s, how old were you in the At the time? Before? Well, we, yeah. when we signed, I was 31. Okay. When we signed, I was 31. Um, and so, I, and I think I quit, I quit my job to write full time, I think, or to, or like I quit my job to pursue a record deal um in oh my gosh i i quit my job in in uh i think it was five years i think it was five years okay so this is the stuff that gets i want are people listening here in that moment you quit your job i mean this people don't make it in music like you if if you have no i mean it's hard it is yeah. not an easy thing. It's not like you really wake up one day and you're like, oh, I'm going to get a record deal. Like it happens for very, 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 very select few people. And it's a hustle. You said it earlier. Like it's a grind to get anywhere yeah. in some of the arts industry across the board, which is sad because there's a lot of really, really talented people. Thankfully, we could spend a whole podcast talking about technology and stuff and YouTube yeah. and all that stuff has made it a lot easier for people, I think, to get stuff out there. And you yeah, can and find- it's a skin thickening experience for well, sure. Because you're going to hear no way more more than you're ever going to hear. Oh, that's awesome. Um, so what was it like? Like what was literally going on in your brain when you're like, I'm going to quit my job and I'm going to do, I mean, because that's a pretty big, you have family at this point. You're married to Julie, right? Wasn't you have, married. You weren't married yet. Wasn't married. Got married, uh, got married two months before we signed to Columbia actually. Okay. Um, but you we were together. We weren't married. Uh, but yes, we were together. Um, and yeah, I Probably mean, I remember knew it was moving in that direction, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think mean, you we were... knew. Yeah. When I, I was in Nashville, I moved to Nashville shortly after I met Julie and I was only there for a short time. And, uh, when we, when we agreed that I was going to, um, move, I was gonna move back up to St. Louis. She had a condo and uh we were we were talking about me moving into the condo and i said under one condition i'm never moving out (laughs) and and it still took me five more years to propose to her but (laughs) we knew i mean yeah we just we just knew i mean i yeah i could literally talk for hours about how amazing she is but yeah um so uh what but what were we talking about so you knew all that stuff you're gonna get whatever your oh, relationship yeah. you've so, got it's yeah. more than so just working you. as an All art this director stuff doesn't yeah I, just hinge on yeah so i was what doing Brian i was doing the design do. stuff and i was in a i was in a job that was just it was a good job but it was just you know it was just it was just kind of not a not a um like as far as work is concerned it was fine but it was just not a good place you know uh, i don't want to call it toxic as much as it was just not a very well run environment and i just wanted out and yeah. um and I, and I just, I had a conversation with Julie and I was like, Hey, I, you know, I think it's time that I just get out of this and start working. You know, I'll find, I'll find my own clients and do a little bit of, uh, and I think at the time I actually had one client that I was doing side work for. And I'm like, okay. you know, I'm making enough money doing a little bit of this side work that I just, I think I would, I want to quit this full-time thing. Yeah. And she was a thousand percent in. She was just like, awesome. you need to do it. You need to do it. Um, and so I like, I think I started waiting tables uh, to supplement what I was yeah. doing, you know? So I was doing graphic design, waiting tables um, and writing songs. And, and that was it. And I did that, I think for the better part of five years, but I mean, you know, that's writing songs, that's recording. I met amazing musicians. Uh, one of my, uh, one of my old friends, uh, his name's David Beeman. He owns a studio here in town called native sound. Um, unbelievable, un probably one of the most extraordinary artists I've ever personally known just mm-hmm. because he can play and do anything yeah. and he's a writer and he finishes one good idea and he just moves on to the next. It's just absolutely, it's just absolutely insane. And he had like kind of the opposite. I'm going to, I'm tangenting it's again, right. but, um, anyway, so, uh, he kind of helped me 
on the drum side, but even on the writing side, because he just ha- he he was just such a different spirit to mm-hmm. be around. Um, everything was positive. Everything was encouraging. Everything was like he just he had a habit of just like um, trying to figure out what he loved about something, then trying to figure out what he could find critical about it. Right, but, and it yeah. just and it just rubbed off on me in, in a in a great way. And you know me well enough to know that like I'm a bit of a critic actually. Mm-hmm. So to be around <laughs> someone who's you know. At, and just as bad on myself as I am on I, everybody else. I get, yeah. So to have that energy, I think was really helpful. Yeah. But, um, yeah. Okay. So sadly, I wish we could talk for two hours all about this stuff. Cause mm. I know there's you and I've spent three years talking about some of the stuff. Mm. There's a lot of good stories in there. <laughs> Give me, I want to ask this question try to keep it. Oh boy. <laughs> succinct. What would you say you got the record deal? One of the, top highlight moments of the run after that being a recording artist touring all that stuff what would be a couple give us a couple of the top fun moments surprising moments um probably one of the coolest moments would it would be watching uh watching the string section when we were recording the first album there were two songs on the album that had strings Mm-hmm. And this, uh, gosh, I wish I could remember his name. I just, I actually just found the handwritten stuff a couple of months ago. But um, so I worked with, we were in Vancouver and I worked with this gentleman, gosh, I wish I could remember his name, uh, who basically helped arrange the string parts. And then about halfway through the recording process, uh, we went back to Armory Studios in Vancouver and recorded just, you know, professional. It was, and it was just, I was so excited. It was, it was absolutely incredible to watch. Uh, cause the, you know, here are these, here are your songs and you're, you know, they're, yeah, yeah. they're sitting out there just play they, like they're pros. They just walk in, you put music in front of them and they just start playing. They've never heard it. And that's really, called sight reading. E- that's right. <laughs> Well done. <laughs> and, uh, and you know, he's kind of responsible for, you know, getting them to do what we're collectively yeah. thinking. Yeah. Um, and that was like, a, there's video of it. Just me standing there with my hand in front of my face, just going, I, I cannot believe what's happening yeah, right now. It was just so beautiful. I mean, those instruments are, they are just so pretty. It's completely out of my comfort zone where I can't play anything like that. Um, yeah, so I think it was a four, it was a four it was like a quartet on one song and then and then an octet on okay. the other song, and it was just it was just fun. It was just really I mean like that's the kind of thing that when it's happening you're like where am I right now? I bet there's something really cool about anytime you watch. Well, I can't imagine. You know I'm a string fan, but watching something that you had birthed and you created, watching it come to life and other people do it, like it really is not a body. Experience. Yeah, and I'm sure you listening it probably it doesn't just be in the music world. I mean, yeah. whatever it is, you're creating something, you poured your heart and soul into something and watching it actually be a tangible living, breathing thing is just uh, all of it. Yeah. Amaz- amazing. And they are amazing. so, you know, go, that journey, first of all, it happens so, uh, it happens so fast. Like once people are sort of interested, things just kind of start happening and you, you're just sort of, I, I used to call it, I'm just hanging on for dear life. Like you go from feeling like you're trudging through mud to mm-hmm. just feeling like you're hanging on for dear life, trying to make a good decision with each opportunity that comes up. But every little thing, like, I mean, I remember when we, I went and bought the van and I wrote a check for it because we were given money to get, you know, to get a touring vehicle. And I'm sitting in this van. I had just bought it and it's, I had never experienced buying a vehicle like that because, Mm -hmm. you know, it was title, all of it. It It's like, it's literally, it was like buying a pop tart. It was just like, here, this is all yours now. And so I just left and I had to get gas and I'm sitting there at the gas station filling up, filling up this van with gas. And I'm like, what is this? And I'm like, (laughs) so I sat in my basement, wrote songs for four or five years. And now I'm, now I'm in a van. That's crazy. It's, it's all of it was really, really surreal like that. So what there's people out here listening that are hustling after something. Yeah. What incur, I mean, like, what would you tell somebody who's like writing the book, baking a thousand cookies, playing, writing 50 songs. They think they're all horrible. You know, whatever, whatever their thing is. Like we have a big thing on the podcast. We talk about like, do something like God's put a gift and a talent. Every single person, we deeply believe that it's our 
job and calling and opportunity and privilege to try to shine out whatever that thing is. And everybody's thing looks different and it can look different throughout the course of your life. But for somebody who's like, oh my gosh, like this is never, I'm never going to get to do this thing. Like I'm never going to get through this. What encouragement would you give them to keep going? Uh, I would say, I would say, I think if you, if you, if you know in your heart that that what you're doing is what you want to do and you're and you're a hundred percent authentic about it, just mm-hmm. keep doing it. Just Good. keep doing it. I mean, I like it's it sounds trite and it's certainly not the first person to say, but I think those qualifiers are pretty important. Yeah. I think authenticity is important. That was something that I kind of didn't have first go round because I was older. I kinda had to, you know, I, I kinda had to mask my my reality because you know the label finding out that i was 31 was like a bad thing so mm-hmm. you know i didn't I, I i didn't feel like i could just freely and openly talk about being married talk about the fact that i had a kiddo and i mean i just i just kept all of that yeah private because you know we were concerned at some point someone would be like wait 31 do the math Mm-mm, we're not interested right mm-hmm. um and so that I think that took a component of authenticity out of it, and I think uh, that's I think that's pretty important. I think you have yeah. to be, um, you got to be, you got to be loving what you're doing, and you got to be you got to be in a point where you can just be authentic about it. I mm-hmm. I don't I don't know if that's good advice. I hope it is. It is good advice. What kept you going when everybody kept telling you no? I mean, you like you said, you got a lot of no's before there was a yes. Like, why? What? Five years is. I mean, honestly, a pretty long time to be writing songs in your basement without I'm not. And it, I, mean, it, deal. I mean, and then and then after it, right? I mean, yeah, because you know that that deal didn't go the way that we wanted it to. Um, so, um, I think just just belief. I mean, for for a very long time, I'd say to this day, I still feel like I was put on this planet to make music. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that was the hardest thing about shutting it down when it was finally just too much work for not enough reward Yeah, was feeling like you were stepping away from the thing that, you know, that, that you were put on the planet to do it. So mm. for, for me, I kind of gave myself no other option. So for a very long time, um, that, that was it. There was no plan B. It was just, this is what we're going to do. And it wasn't until it started to take a toll on my wife and we were talking about, um, <clears throat> actually we already had Stella. So it, it was just, it was just too much. Mm-hmm. It just got to a point where it was too much. Um, and, and, uh, and I think I was also just burnt out enough. Um, cause you know, that's a lot. It's a lot. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I don't know if I, I turned on, I mean, I kind of turned on your question, but, um, it, yeah, I, I just, I, I've always known I've always felt, I should say, that that this is that this is what God wanted me to do, or mm-hmm. this is what uh, this is what I was put on the planet to do. Um, and even when I even when I shut the band down, I I called it a hiatus. You know this, yeah. and uh, I just said, you know, I'm gonna take a break, and I'll get back to it when I can't help myself. Yeah. So. Well, we're going to come back to that in just a second, but I want to stop and I want to talk for a second about where your faith journey kind of intersects with all of this. And you don't have Mm -hmm. to like, you can share as much little as you want. We honestly, the time on these podcasts go way faster than we think. Um, When you're listening to this, everybody, you'll know if this was a one part or a two part, as far as this Uh, even first part, we haven't even gotten to the other whole, we have a whole nother conversation to have in a minute. Wow. Um, This is why. Yeah. Anyway. Okay. So faith. Yep. Tell us a little bit about just that. How did you get to a place where you're walking with the Lord in the relationship you got right now? How'd you get there? Yeah. I mean, so I grew up Catholic, so I, I always had faith has always been something that's, it's been part of my life. Um, but I didn't, you know, so I would say when I, I left the Catholic church as a young adult, but I didn't leave, you know, I probably left as an agnostic. Mm-hmm. So I always had a component of faith. And I remember, um, I was talking earlier about when the band, when the, when that first band broke up, it was a really stressful time. And I mean, I was, I was coming apart and, and Julie was like, dude, you're stressed. And, uh, I remember very, very specific moment where I just said, you know what, this is out of my hands and I have to release control. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it, it that was really a practical move at the time because I was just so stressed and I was so, I mean, um, 
I, I don't, I I wasn't necessarily trying to control everything, but I was just hyper fixating on making the right decisions and things being, you know, whatever. And I just, you know, and when, when band members started, started, uh, going away, it just, it got to a point where I'm like, I, you know, you're realizing that you, you can't be in a band by yourself, first of all. Right. (laughs) (laughs) So, uh, I just, yeah, I just, I remember consciously telling myself, you got to let go. You got to give this to God. And I don't know, I don't even really know if I said, you know, I, I definitely had no relationship with Jesus, if you will, relationship with God, if you will, um, at the time. But I, but I knew, uh, I still had a sense that he was in control Mm -hmm. and that if I was going to, if I was going to be able to survive any of it, um, I needed to, I needed to, to release that to him. Yeah. And, uh, and without a doubt, without a doubt, it was moments after I did that, that, that the band started running away from me. Hmm. Like it, it was crazy. I mean, I, I, those, those were very distinctively, um, two, two things that happened back to back. I released control and, uh, and everything started moving in the right direction and I attributed it to it. Yeah. Right? Um, and I mean, so somebody needs to hear that. Cause that's a, <laughs> all of us, whether right? we're control freaks or not. Yeah. I was going to thread that in earlier. To... And then I was like, I've been yapping for so long that no, if I it's... try to, if I try to go back to tell that story, so I'm glad that you asked that because it's, it was, I, I mean, it, 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 you know, it's not a, I'm not making that up. Right. Like it was, it was a noticeable turn of events. I said, let go of this yeah. and just, do, you know, take, take responsibility for the part that you can handle, yeah. give the rest to God and let's get after it. And that's when things started getting carried away quick, which, Love it. you know, and so that, you know, I, n- I never lost sight of that. I don't think, mm-hmm. um, and then, um, and then some friends that I met, particularly my friend, Brad, that I met along the way, he was actually, he worked with that company, um, that, uh, that bought boomers at the time. Uh, that's how I met him. But I remember, I remember sitting at a Buffalo wild wings and he was just telling me, um, just how settled his heart was because he had a relationship with Christ. Mm. He believed, um, you know, he, he, uh, he's actually very, very well read with regards to the Bible. Um, and so, you know, he just sort of like led me along that path, kind of mm-hmm. encouraged me to, um, I mean, he is for sure what, I mean, there's always Mark, right? Yeah. Uh, so I've always had that influence. And after we got off the road, um, with, uh, well, whatever, again, Mark is his so brother, many details. Yes. FYI. My brother, again. My brother, Mark. <laughs> again, worship, worship guy, uh, musician, leader, worship leader. So, um, so there was that too, but so, you know, there was a time where that kind of, those paths all sort of crossed. And I would say that's when, you know, that's when I experienced, you know, the softening of the heart kind of stuff. Yeah. And I was just like, oh man, like this is, you know, this is where I need to be. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's, I started, I started, uh, volunteering for the, for the praise team at, uh, Mark's church. Um, and then obviously we got out of that for a little while. Um, and I, and I, yeah, I would just say that that's, is that how it started? Is that a good enough? Like yeah, that's, okay. that's great. Is, I don't know what <laughs> Is your it answer? short enough? Is I it good enough? Yeah. It's perfect, Brian. Yeah. Positive feedback only for you. It's perfect. Wow. Um, <laughs> So real quick. Okay. So <clears throat> eventually the band ends. That is a story for another day, mm-hmm. but okay. let we, yeah, but it, the time on that closed, that was how many years ago? 10. And almost, you just said almost to the, almost, uh, well, very close to 10. It's just over 10 at this point. Okay. It was 10 in November of it. last year. Yeah. Something cool happened this last November. We'll yeah, to that that's second. right. Okay. So <laughs> you said it was a hiatus, <clears throat> knowing that at some point, maybe you would pick back up songwriting, music, whatever. I mean, you, there's not like you yeah. completely walked away from it. You were doing stuff in there, just not. Yeah. I, mean, I was, we were, we were, I had some friends, we were playing, uh, we were playing shows every once in a while, just acoustic cover stuff. And um, like I said, I, you know, for, for the majority of those 10 years, I was, 
or for the first part of those 10 years, I was playing, I mean, some of that overlaps actually. I was, uh, playing drums for the most part. I played drums at, uh, at Mark's church. Yeah. And that was because it was just very different from what I was doing, um, uh, with the band. So it just sort of felt like, didn't feel like the same thing. And I wasn't really interested in singing or playing guitar or anything like that. Um, just kind of sitting, I've always been a closet drummer. So sitting back there and doing that was um, tons of fun, but it was also very worshipful for me. Like I, there were a lot of really defining moments for me back there too. Um, uh, and I okay. think that's, you know, that's also where I started to, what was the question? <laughs> I asked you what you did. <laughs> oh my God. I asked you what you did for the 10 year, your hiatus where I'm getting to, I'm getting to the Matthew six project. Brian is what I'm trying to get. To. Oh yeah. Well, so you took a break from music, worship, mm-hmm. faith growing, going to church, being involved in praise team. Yep. God's working on your heart. Probably a lot in there. Opened yep. up to a whole different kind of venue of music mm-hmm. venue, vein the music category of music. Not yep. that you hadn't been exposed vein, to it, sure. but worship music is kind of its own kind of thing. And arguably keeps getting better and better. It I does. Think, no, you know? I would agree with that. I mean, there, there, there was, all, you know, all sorts of stuff that I loved back when I started playing with Mark, but I mean, no, nah, I mean, there's some pretty good stuff, but it keep. I feel like it keeps getting better. It does. I it really does get do. better. Um, so, what happened in the last year, year and a half? <laughs> so I don't know how long the time frame was. What that happened you were to- like, I'm going to kind of dive back into this music stuff a little bit. I have no idea. I know this. <laughs> I know the series of events. I know the series of events. The but Lord I, where I, yeah. F- right? Meeting Sarah Good. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> wow. Joining the worship team. Oh, wow. I didn't say, well, it was I definitely said the that, Lord right? first. I said the um, worship team because you told me it was a lot. Well, you know that when when you and I started talking about the worship team, I was super on the fence, right? I mean, yeah. you were you were kind of talking about it earlier. That's what um, I said. Mo- person who like I couldn't really tell. I'm like, am I supposed to be talking you into or out of being a part of this? I didn't really know. <laughs> and I <laughs> and I told you, I was like, I just I had so much baggage. I just it's just a lot. It's it's just a lot. And I think I think you've experienced it at this point, yes. but, um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, we, when we were looking for a church, um, you know, music was a important component. So it was kind of nice when we came into two rivers and we, you know, we were like, yeah, okay. The band's good. Uh, bands arguably way better now. Um, but, um, that was an important component. And then when, you know, when I felt like to me, the band was like, okay, I can sit here. I can listen to this. It's worshipful. I can sort mm-hmm. of, you know, I, this is a good way for me to start church and it's not a distraction. Like we had definitely been to other churches where I'm like, this is bad enough that it's, it's just too much of a distraction. Yeah. And I just, I can't, I'm not, it's not worshipful, uh, worshipful for me. So, um, that was a good start. And then the band got better and, um, and you and I, met and then of course there was kim who was basically the catalyst for all of it <laughs> we have this friend who basically would tell me all the time hey my friend brian is really great he wants to be a part of the worship team hey have you heard my friend my friend brian and i was like yeah. brian needs to come talk to me i'm like i great whoever brian is i'm real excited about but yeah. not gonna can't just yeah she talk definitely to me. facilitated she a was lot great of it, but, everybody uh, needs a kim in their life that basically champions them and actually forces them to do stuff. No, when they're, you're not kidding. <laughs> they're not. They're but not I mean, right. I, I think I was secretly like loving the fact that she was championing me, but yeah. I was also just kind of terrified because I just knew, you know, I knew that. That's where I said, that's you why I tracked right you down headspace. in the lobby. Cause you literally walked by and I was like, she's told me like 50 times and this dude just walked by me. I'm just going to have a conversation. Yeah. And that's what kind of started it. Yeah, for sure. So, but um, that didn't start the. I mean, you started back in music at Two Rivers. You it was really the production the drum thing, song. right? Yeah, we worked on something, and then just we're gonna we're gonna do another episode. We're gonna to talk more about Matthew Six because there's a really big idea behind it. But just give a little bit of the what happened to actually make you go. I actually want to do a whole nother album. Yeah, of a totally different 
genre than what you had done before. Yeah, completely <laughs> different. Um, just give a little bit of the like the high level of like, yeah. how the heck did you go from I'm not doing anything musical to I'm serving at my church. I'm kind of doing this thing. I'm liking it a little bit. You're to, doing a great job. Just keep going. I'm doing a whole <laughs> I mean, I can tell the story, but yeah. it's your story. Well, yeah, you're painfully <laughs> familiar with it. Uh, a little bit. Yeah, aware, but- it started with the production stuff, right? We had done the Oh Holy Night thing, um, and we were you know hammering my brother for Pro Tools help because yeah. I didn't have any of that stuff updated um and so you and i sort of agreed like hey let's i'm gonna update my production stuff i can help the church with you know the the bigger events and then any other stuff and so i all of a sudden i'm staring at pro tools again going man you look familiar and you know (laughs) sight for sore eyes kind of thing right yeah and uh and then of course you I, I'm assuming that you want me to mention the fact that you sent me not, a text. <laughs> I did not need any name recognition. Well, I, uh, <laughs> in all fairness, that's where it was, right? Like you, you brought up uh, doing a recording of Raise a Hallelujah. And it sort of occurred to me that like we, we could absolutely, you know, that happens all the time. Yeah. So like, why, w- why wouldn't we? It gives us some, gives us a project, gives us something to do. And yeah. I love the song. I like our voices on the song. Yeah. We've certainly been told that by enough people that it was like, it just kind of felt justified. Uh, but as I've said before, I, I just, I wanted to do something different. And so I think that's, that's kind of how it all, that's kind of how it all started. It wasn't. Um, and we only can sing songs that have Al- Hallelujah in it. That's my rule. That's how it started for a second, right? If it didn't have the word hallelujah, I will not sing it with Brian. Well done. There you go. So So next week you're in the clear. (laughs) Oh. Yeah. Right? Okay, good. I can sing with you next week. Perfect. Okay, good. We'll be fine. Um, we the very first song we sang was it was called Hallelujah. Yeah. Um I just totally blanked on the dude's name. What's the cover? Yes. Of the very famous Hallelujah. And there's like an Easter version of it. Yeah, and basically cool. somehow I still to this day do not know how I convinced you to sing that part of that song. <laughs> that song Cause this I was see, only I think a couple months into right? you being on the team and I had had vocal nodules and hadn't even been, it was really, it, we were, that was, yeah, I would actually, I think that was a, the evidence that was, that was the evidence that, you know, that I really did want to, you know, yeah. Um, either that or it's just, you know, it's just evidence of your persuasiveness. Mm, it's definitely is that, that what it is. Very yeah. persuasive yeah, I when I need I to knew. be. Very yeah. good gift of persuasion. Yeah, I love it. Anyway, okay, so you we mm-hmm. just released this fun project in November. Yep. Um. So basically, what I'm going to tell you all of you listening is we're going to give you a little teaser for it. Now that something good is going to put out a bonus episode where Brian and I are going to talk way more in depth about the project, the heart behind it, where it came from. Um, but give the, just give a little bit, if nobody goes and listens to that episode, <laughs> tell them what Matt, what's in the couple so sentences. So if, if I describe it now and they're like, meh. No, you're no. going to want to listen to this. I don't, I, I feel a little, this is the part where I had something to do with it. Not a lot really, but even if I had nothing to do with it, this is an incredible project and I'm serious. Everybody needs to go listen to it. It's really, really, really good. Well, thank you for saying that, but yeah, I think you had a lot to do with it. I mean, I think an important component for a creative person is to have, you know, have a peer to bounce ideas off of. And that for me, you know, uh, there's always my family, right? But yeah. of course they have to listen to the development. So they get tired of all of it so quickly. And I, you know, you get to the point where you're just like, I'm so sorry, but I just want you to hear this. Just listen <laughs> it's like, like, Oh, I'm cooking. Can you please, you know, it just, <laughs> but, um, but also, I mean, you're a musician, right? And you're a creator. So, um, I, you know, I had, I've, I've told you that if I, if I, didn't have you to bounce those. I mean, you, especially as a creator, you need a safe place yeah. to share what could be a bad idea. Right. Yeah. Um, and, uh, when you don't have that, it can be a little bit of a challenge to sort of push forward and find the motivation or the encouragement or the validation, all of those things that, you know, yeah. we creatives need to basically combat our imposter syndrome. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and you were, you were there for all of that. So, um, uh, not to mention, obviously, you know, you were, um, you were, you were the voice, the other, the other voice of Raise a Hallelujah <laughs> the and, and the idea behind recording it in the first place. So I love it. Well, it's a really cool project. Um, we're going to talk more about it. Go check it out. 
Brian, this is what I need to ask you. Where do they go to check it out? They're going to, well, I'm going to ask you several <laughs> things. So they're going to go to, you're going to tell them, where do they go to find it, oh. Brian? Uh, is it, it's Matthew six project dot, dot com. com. Mm-hmm. Got it right. How, why does, why do I have to think about that? I don't know. That should roll off the tongue. It literally though, that thing, it was like all, I mean, you spent a ton of that last leg of November. It came out November 16th. There's a bit of a spring. And it was a ton of I think all of us, but definitely you obviously had way more time and stuff invested, but hit a wall. It was just like, yeah. And it's, I, we, it's I done, joke, but I joke that the project sounds like something that, you know, you should be able to finish in a month, which arguably it does. Uh, but there's just so much more that yeah. went into it, um, yeah. developing it and, and, uh, the learning curve, whatnot, but, um, yeah, so, very proud of it. Um, and it's, uh, you know, I think it's a much better, bigger thing than just this, yeah. you know, just the EP that's out there right now. Um, but yeah, if, if, uh, if folks are interested in, in so getting an idea Matthew of what Six it's about, project.com, you can go mm -hmm. YouTube. You can find actually a really cool behind the scenes video that you should go watch and check out truth. Follow on Instagram, and Facebook, Matthew's mm -hmm. project, not hard to find. Mm -hmm. Um, you can listen to it everywhere, pretty much everywhere. I think. Um, yep. wherever you listen to music, you can find it. Apple music, Spotify. Yeah. Go do that. Um, title if people want to go hear <laughs> brian roach the early years <laughs> oh boy what's the name of, you never said the name of the band it has two different two what do they look for to go hear your band that had the record deal and all that stuff they want to go listen uh okay auto vein is the uh it well so the first record it's called bullets and bruises and i don't know where i think pandora is the only place that you can find that but you could you might be able to find that on like YouTube or something. Okay. Um, uh, and then auto vein, uh, which is auto like car vein, like, you know, your blood. blood. Vein. Yeah. yeah. Um, that eventually became like toward the very end, it became revolution one. Um, and so on Apple music, uh, and Spotify and stuff like that, I think the second half, the, the, the um the second record and then the third ep are under that name revolution okay one. so we can go check it out if you're so inclined you should go be inclined to go just listen to it so you have a you just gotta you just gotta have something to give context for what sure. you're talking about yeah so I no i'm i'm proud of all of that stuff so i mean by all means go listen to it so brian thank you for sharing your story and thank we're all you over. for we having could me talk 20 more podcast episodes about random Brian Roach life. We have countless cell phone hours to prove it. <laughs> <laughs> we do. We do. But the last question we ask everybody mm. is officially part of the podcast is the last thing you got to do is you got to tell us one more good thing, something good. It can be anything, story, product. I don't care. I don't, I'm not going to give a qual too many qualifiers, but just tell us something good. Uh, one more good thing. Tell us something good, Brian Roach. Uh, and it can't be that the Blues scored twice in two you minutes to win today. You can say whatever you want to say. If that's what your good thing is, go for it. Talk oh, about I it. Oh, I want it to be something better than that. But well, that's you're a Blues sort of, fan, so that that's was... An, that's an on-the-spot question. I want it to be... I want it to be more... I'm still writing. That's not a good... That's selfish. That is something... No, it's... Is it? Is, it, is, that, a, is that a good thing, that there's more okay, Matthew 6 stuff coming? Okay, first of all, coming? good things need no qualifiers. They're just good. Okay. And the fact that you're writing is... That's a good thing. You enjoy it. It brings you life. And hopefully other people get to hear it. Okay. I'll, sp I'll say that, uh, that each week more people are listening to Matthew 6. It still feels so selfish. I wanted something better than It's not than selfish because here's the deal with the heart of it. Because you Just didn't actually say what the heart of Matthew 6 is. What's Matthew, why is it called Matthew 6? Yeah. So it comes from the verse. It, it comes from Matthew 6, 5 through 8. Um, basically just talks about... Um, uh, when you, when you pray, mm -hmm. don't do it in front of people. This, I'm literally going to simplify this, but, uh, don't do it in front of people. Do it by yourself, right? Yeah. What God kind of already knows what you want. Um, go to your room, close the door, pray in secret. Um, God knows what you want. Um, and it, you know, basically encourages us to spend alone time rather than, you know, uh, get out there and be spiritual in front of everybody so that, you know, everybody else can hear what you. So I, yeah. I had the idea of taking that idea that was about prayer and applying it to worship music. So it's, you know, Matthew six, the Matthew six project started with the idea of taking big corporate worship tunes that were kind of designed to be, you know, large crowd moments or big mm -hmm. moments and stripping them down into 
super intimate, personal sort of reverent pieces. So that's what that is. They're amazing. And there's five cover songs. That's true. Three Brian Rich original songs. Also true. And so it's good. You can go listen to it. Literally, it will be, like I said, I can be biased because I'm involved, but not involved. I'm adjacent. Well, not really, but... (laughs) Yeah, you it's, are. It's really, it's really good and has been a huge personal blessing to me. So, and to Will. And so go listen to it. Yeah, same. It's something and, good. And we've already heard um, pretty incredible stories about, yeah. about how, that's, um, how that music is impacting folks, which is very, very different from... So that's what I was going to say. That's why it's not selfish that more people are listening to it because the heart is we want more people to be impacted by it's not about Brian or yeah, the project. I, th- I think the idea about- of it is, I think anybody can listen to the idea and listen to the execution and go, I, I want to do that. And they don't, you know, Matthew six project doesn't have to be music, uh, recorded or written by Brian Roach or Sarah good, or I, I, it can be anybody. It's, mm-hmm. it's an idea of saying, Hey, take this thing and turn it into a moment that's personal to you. Yeah. Um, which I think was one of the things that was a little terrifying about sharing is it's very, very, it is very, very personal. Mm-hmm. Um, but, um, but I think that's why it's resonating, um, yeah. with folks. I've had a handful of people tell me that uh they just cried listening to it and i'm like oh my goodness i'm not sure if that was the idea behind it but um yeah people just it's it's definitely um it's a personal thing it's it's yeah. uh yeah it's really good that's definitely something good brian see it worked <laughs> good. Sure i'm good? glad okay awesome thanks for being here brian thank you for having me yeah Well, thank you so much again for listening to our conversation today with our friend, Brian. I really hope that you go check out the Matthew 6 Project. It really has been something really special to Will and I. It's actually made a huge impact on us personally. We are huge champions of really good things, and that has definitely been something good in our life, and we believe would be really good in your life. This music um, and the pace of it and the vibe of it seems to be completely on time with just what we've personally needed in our times of worship, but that what I just think collectively we could all use. Sometimes we need just those more personal, quiet, intimate moments of worship in the Matthew 6 project, I think will meet you just right in those beautiful, quiet moments as your heart just speaks and connects hopefully with the heart of the Father. So as we shared on the podcast, you can find it in the show notes, but go check it out, matthew6project.com on social, anywhere of those places, anywhere you listen to music, you can download it and find it. And I hope you'll go listen. And I hope you'll come back and tell us about it. We would love to hear what your thoughts are on the music and how it's impacting you. So make sure to stay tuned too, where Brian and I are going to talk a little more about that project. This episode was already a little longer than we normally do, but there was just so much to share and so much to cover. And we would love to tell you even more of the heart um, behind the Matthew 6 project. So I hope you will join us back here really soon to hear a little more about that. And we'll also be back sharing more stories real soon. So have a great week. And I hope that you're able to go find and share a little something good with someone around you today.